Sunday morning, we continue our series of messages on the Christ-like mind that brings Christian joy. Let me ask you a question. Where do your thoughts come from? You ever thought about that? Where do your thoughts come from? How do they affect your life? Is it possible for you to filter your thoughts? And just how much of an impact does it have on your life? Well, we know that it affects the whole person, body, soul, and spirit. Someone said that thoughts are like a mountain stream that comes rushing down the top of a mountain, comes down into the valley, and fills the springs, the lakes, and the rivers, and runs into the ocean. Thusly, thoughts come into the mind and affect every part of our body. Now, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Is it possible for me to think Christ-like thoughts? Is it possible for me to have the mind of Christ? And if that's possible, what will that do for me? What change will there be in my life if I'm that type of a person? And the Bible gives us some very explicit instructions about having the mind of Christ. As a matter of fact, it says you have the mind of Christ. But how does that work in our life? As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Satan knows the power of your mind. He knows the power of our mind. And we've got to see that the Spirit of God controls what we allow to go into the mind, stay there, and then permeates out into our life. I want to take some time with this and go into all of this. How does this relate to this life that we're living. And I hope that you'll come Sunday, bring somebody with you. And a very, very important. Can you imagine the difference? If you wake up of a morning and you start your day and you're thinking his thoughts. He leads you into every avenue of life. You react as he would react. You would respond as he would respond. Boy, just to think about that, wow. But how could that happen? Can it happen? All right, we're thinking about the making of a man of God. The making of a man of God. I've read the biographies of some of the greatest men. Spurgeon, Calvin, Tyndale, Wycliffe. And just on and on and on. And uh, then I've read the life of some of the contemporary preachers. R.G. R. Lee and so forth and so on. And when I read their lives, I realize that they were men. Just like I am. They were people just like you. They had their ups and downs. They had their victories. They had their defeats. But every one of them had something. They had something that set them apart from others. I'm not going to say any more about that right now. I will when we get into the nitty-gritty of the life of this man, Samuel. The making of a man of God. I don't know whether you know this or not, but Spurgeon was given to depression. And many times... He got into real struggles and battles because of depression. He, was, he battled gout. And sometimes that gout would be so bad that he would have to go to the south of France to a warmer climate and spend as much as three or six months and regain his health. And then he'd come back to the Baptist Tabernacle. And he would come back rejuvenated. And thousands and thousands of people 
would be saved. Can you imagine speaking to 10 to 20,000 people without a microphone and giving an invitation and they just flood to the front to be saved? And, Cal and he was a Calvinist. Spurgeon was a Calvinist. He believed in election. But he also stood in the pulpit with tears and would say, come and receive Christ as your Savior, with tears in his eyes. That type of a man. That, that type of a man. And then you think about a man like R.G. Lee, pastor of Bellevue in Memphis. What an orator. If you have ever heard him preach, uh, he was a linguist. I mean, he had a, he, he had a hold on language. He knew how to use words. And was a master of words, an orator. He could, he could speak fluently. Tremendous power and quote poems and quote scripture. And, and people would sit mesmerized by his ministry. And yet thousands would come and trust Christ as Savior. Dr. Lee Robertson, in my opinion, one of the greatest men that I've ever met. And frankly, when I arrived at school for a long while, I was, fr I was afraid of him. There was just such an awe about him. And uh, I, I really didn't want to walk up and talk to him because I felt that he was way here and I'm way down there. And I'm just, ta I'm just talking to you. I'm just talking to you about a man of God, a woman of God. And there was a day that I ran into a problem at our church. And I didn't know how to handle it. And I thought, I'm going to go see Dr. Robertson. These other guys go to see him. And I saw Dr. Faulkner in going into the dining hall one day, and I walked up to Dr. Faulkner, and I said, Dr. Faulkner, do you think Dr. Robertson would have a little time for me? And he looked at me and put his hand on my shoulder. He said, why, Bob, he'd be happy to see you. And I'm still scared, and I go into his secretary's office, and I'm sitting down, and I'm just nervous. And the secretary says, Dr. Robertson will see you now. And I walked in, and the first thing that man did was put his arms around me and said, it's so good to see you. I'm so glad you're here. Little old country boy like me, I'm so glad you're here on campus with us. And he said, what can I do for you? And we sat down and we talked about the problem and he laid it out and just gave me exact instructions as to what to do. And he said, now before you go, and this, this pastor of a school that uh, was the second largest private school in the state of Tennessee, next to Vanderbilt, up to, up to six, seven, eight thousand students. A church of 15, 20,000 people on campus on Sunday morning. Uh, that type of preacher. Missionaries all over the world, all kind of ministries. And he said, now I want to give you something. And he, this, this man that I highly revere got down on his knees, pulling out books and records and tapes and he picked them up like this, and he walked up over to him, and he said, I want you to have these. These will help you. Bob, these will help you in your ministry. And he laid them down, and he said, now I want us to pray. And he said, let's kneel down. I kneeled down at the desk, and he put his arm around me, and I didn't say a thing. I didn't say a thing. I just listened. And he prayed for me. That's the type of man we need. That's the type of woman that we need. Now, you go through the Bible, these men and women were human just like you. They were, they're human just like you. But they had something. Well, maybe I ought to say this. God had them. Maybe that would be the best way to say it. God had them. Does he have me? Does he have you? How much of you does God have? All of you or just a little bit? When I die and when you die, how far along will we have come in our relationship with our great God? The making of a man of God. I hope and pray that you're thinking with me as we go through these verses about being a woman of God, a man of God. <clears throat> you have your setbacks. I know you do. You have them. You're making progress and you're going along and then all of a sudden you just hit a brick wall. You're happy, you're rejoicing, things are, God's blessing you, and then all of a sudden things just turn, and you wonder, how, how could I do that? 
How? How did that happen? How did I say that? Where did that attitude come from? I was moving along so well, making progress, and all of a sudden now it feels like I'm going backwards, and I'm being pulled backwards. And we're building and we're battling, building and we're battling, building and we're battling all of the time. Now hold your place in 1 Samuel 3. Hold your place there. And go over to Hebrews chapter 11. I love <clears throat> chapter 11. Now I know I'm chasing a little rabbit, but that's okay. I need to catch him. Now, you understand, we call this the Hall of Faith. God's Hall of Heroes, if you will. And we could say that. But did you notice something in this passage? Look at verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report, through faith. Did you notice every one of them it says, by faith Abel, and by faith Enoch, and by faith Noah, and by faith Abraham. And you just go on and on and on. And by faith Jacob, and by faith Joseph, and by faith Moses. Verse 24, by faith Moses, when he was come to years, Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. And then he goes on and talks about his life of faith, and what a life of faith that it was. And I love verse 32. Look at it. And what shall I say more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephna, of David also, Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the alien. And he goes on and on. But look at verse 36. Now, one name after another has been mentioned, right? One name after another has been mentioned. By faith, by faith, by faith. Now look at verse 36. And others. No name mentioned. No name mentioned. And others. Go on. Had trial of cruel mockings, scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were swan asunder, they were tempted, were slain with a sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith. Now look at that. And these all, having obtained a good report. When I get home, will my report be a good one? When I get home, will my report be a good one. By the way, your report will be there. It'll be there. Mine will too. Our report is going to be there. Now the devil is going to inundate you with every reason why should, you should not serve God. We live in probably some of the most perilous times since the days of Noah. And a lot of people are just going to give up and quit. They're going to say it's not worth it. But I want a good report, don't you? Look at verse 40. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Brother Mark has asked me to speak at the first men's meeting. I believe that's not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday. And I was sitting at my desk this morning, and I was reading Job. 
I'm reading through the Old Testament again. I, I arrived at Job 1 today. I've read that book. I've read that passage many, many times. And I read chapter 1. A perfect and upright man. One that hated evil. Eschewed evil. Hated evil. Loved righteousness. And all of a sudden, everything he's got has gone. Everything he's got. And then his wife says to him, why do you hold your integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? And the man wouldn't do it. He wouldn't quit. You know what the first thought came to my mind this morning as I read that? When I get to heaven, I want to look up Job. When I get to heaven, I want to look up Job. There are some people I want to talk to. I want to talk to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. You know why? Jesus loved to be in their home. So there must have been something about them. Of course, there were things they needed, but I think that there was something about them. He was always welcome, amen? Always welcome in their home. I want to meet them, but I want to meet Job. All of his sons, all of his daughters, all of his wealth, his health, family, but he would not curse God. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I don't know whether to say this or not, but I guess I'm going to go ahead and say it. When you get to heaven, is there going to be anybody that wants to look you up? He led me to Jesus. She led me to Jesus. You know, my life was going far away from God, but because of you. Because of you. You prayed for me. You came to me right at the right time. Sometimes you never know. I was, uh, I've told you about my battle, about going to Tennessee Temple, battling about it. I'm standing at, uh, at Oster Manufacturing Co Company, and I started out at work there buffing can opener housings. That's hard work. And I'm debating about this is a good job. This is a good job. And those thoughts, well, I can go to Pleasantdale and you know, all, the, all those thoughts. A man walked up to me who was uh, the guys that come around and they... Uh, take down what you do and how long it takes you to do it and timekeepers and that kind of a thing and a nice guy and he was a Christian and he said uh, uh, Mr. Boofer can I uh, can I watch what you do and blah 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 and I said yes sure go right ahead and after he got through he looked at me and he said I hear you're a preacher and I said uh, yeah I've been praying about going to Tennessee Temple and studying for the ministry, and he just looked me right in the eye and said, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And it is just like somebody took a hammer and hit me in the head. It's just like a bolt in the heart. What are you doing here? What are you doing here? And that was really the day I made up my mind, that's it, I'm not taking this anymore. That's not it, that's where I'm going. Now, I worked there for a while because I had to pay a school bill. You got that? You have to pay a school bill. But just that word, I'll never forget him. I'll never forget him. It's an ordinary Christian. What are you doing here? You never know, folk. You never know. The making of a man of God. Now, in 1 Samuel 3 and verse 1, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days, there was no open vision. Verse 7 again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. Verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and did let none of his words fall to the ground. I like that. He let none of his words fall to the ground. Now, we talked about all the things that went up into making of this man, of God. The people that he was involved in, the climate that he was involved in. And we talked about, first of all, there was a godly mother. 
and uh, thank God for a godly mother and a godly father. You can't overemphasize a godly father. You can't overemphasize a godly mother. There was a father came to me this, just this last week and said to me, he said, uh, you know, you said in the pulpit that you and Miss Sue pray together and years ago you and your family prayed together. He said, my family started doing that. We're reading the Bible, we're praying together at night before we go to bed. And you know, I said in my heart, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And this is what came to my mind. And every night and every morning I've been praying that every member of Journey Baptist Church will pray together every night before they go to bed. Now, sometimes that's not possible. I understand that. Work conditions, dad may not be there, but mom, you can get the children around, whatever. But when the family's there and mom and dad is there with the children, read the Bible and pray. It'll make a gigantic difference in your life and in the life of your children. Parents today are fighting a real battle with children. If you were to spank your child and your neighbor hear about it, well, they'd call the authorities in on you. And I'm old-fashioned. I'm, I'm just old-fashioned. The Bible says that you're to discipline your children. And you don't bruise them. You don't do that. God has a designated place for that to happen. And if you do it right, you're not going to bruise them. Amen? But I understand that. But you know what? Can you imagine a little guy or a little gal just sitting down and daddy's reading the Bible? That'll make an impression. That'll make an impression. Now, thank God for mothers. And I thank God for all the stories of mothers. But buddy, that dad, that son's never going to forget a man, a man reading the Bible and praying. A man saying, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It really bothers me when I watch people come into church and there's a mother and she's pulling all these little kids in. And you know she had a lot of trouble getting them ready and food and all of that, but getting them to church and everything's on her and no help from a sorry man that will stay in bed and won't come to church. I'm sorry. I just feel that way. Be a man. Man up, my soul. Read the Bible and pray to your children. So, but here's a godly mother. But now in chapter 2, you see a careless father. A careless father. And, and there was one here. And his sons uh, just turned out wrong. And what a sad commentary on this careless father. Verse 11 of chapter 2. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he stuck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. And before they burnt the fat, the priest, the servants came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to the roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh, thee that, are, that is raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, and then would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine the stigma of this man that let his boys do whatever they wanted to do? There's always a right way and a, right, a wrong way of doing things. And there was a right way for the priest to minister the offerings of the Lord and a wrong way, and they did it the wrong way, the selfish way, the way they want it done, and Eli didn't say a thing to them. 
I was in the uh, Walmart up in Ladson, not the big Walmart, but the grocery Walmart. I found out it's much easier to get in and out there and they get what you want. And so I was in there and, and I was just going around and I hear awful screams from somewhere. And I thought, my soul, what's going on? And I'm still hear it. And I go around the corner and, and there's a man and his wife and three kids. And those kids are running around pulling things off of shelves. And the daddy say, please don't do that. Don't do that. Honey, don't do that. And the little old girl, little boy just keep pulling things off the shelves. Please don't do that. And I'm thinking, what in the world would have happened to me if I did that with my dad? Whoa. All right, you're not going to like this. Some of you young folk aren't going to like this. But when we went to the store or went somewhere in public with my dad, you know what my dad said? My dad said, now, son, these are good men, and these are fine men, and they're my friends. But don't you say anything to them unless they say something to you. And if they say something to you, you say yes or no, sir, to them. And they're good men. And that's exactly what I did. And you know, because I did that, I developed friendships with older men that lasted me a lifetime because of that, because my dad said this is the way a man ought to act. And then my mother's the same way with my mother. I've told you this story. Now, her thing was church. Buddy, you don't talk in church, and you don't cut up in church, and you sit there and you listen. That was her thing, and that was my grandmother's thing. And I learned to sit there and listen, and I'm glad that I did. I'm also glad for two preachers that made a big difference in my life, too. Our time is gone already, but I'm going to say this. They were men of God. The first two men that were my pastors were men of God. They had a heart, and there was a depth to them. If you get on Facebook at all, you watch carefully, and you're going to see my son Jim Boofer and Becky, they will post again and again and again, Arthur Estes. They, they post him on there again and again, they loved him, and he loved them. When we'd go to Florida, they were all the time sitting in his lap. And he was all the time loving on them. They loved Brother Estes the way I did when I was a boy. And I am so glad I had two preachers that were there for me when I needed them. And then when I was in 16 and 17 years old, God put Wayne Williams in my path. And... During those early years, Wayne was a good guy, and he turned mean in later years. Told things about me in this pulpit that were absolutely not true. Stood right here, a man of God, and told things about me that never happened. That stupid little rabbit. I never had a little pet rabbit. And he gloried in that. And Mike's over laughing because he loved every single minute of it. Were you here, Tom, for that? Yeah, you enjoyed it too. I know you did. I've held that against you for a long time. <laughs> Folks, if you think things are bad now, a, a live bunny come hopping down the aisle. A guy dressed in a bunny suit came hopping down the aisle. I went to my office the next morning, and so help me, there were bunnies all over my office. I turned my computer on, and bunnies were running all over the, all over the computer. And I said to myself, if I get a hold of Wayne Williams, I will kill him. And I've never let him forget that. But you know what? That's the way it ought to be among God's people. Amen? Love coming to church. Have a great time with it. Amen? Love it. And you know what will happen? Uh, other people will enjoy it too. Okay? All right. I've said my piece. You can stand. And we'll be dismissed. Betty Hall, I've got to say is I wish you'd have pushed him out of that little tub. That's all I've got to say. I, I'll say no more. Uh, but that, in Christian love, of course. <laughs> all right. Brother Billy, will you dismiss us, please?